Hey, what's up guys, Mendel here. I hope you're doing all awesome and wonderful because today we're gonna do one of my favorite things, which is mixing orchestra in a metal mix. So as always, let's dig right in, here we go. Okay, so now before we go into mixing, there are a couple of things I wanna say which I think are crucial slash very important with um, adding orchestra and a metal mix or perhaps even orchestration in general and let's start with orchestration itself now I know there are no rules in music I'm a big advocate of that but um, I think we all like clarity that we we can hear everything and which and this is a crucial part with, with orchestration itself in my opinion or dare I say with my experience um, I think you get more clarity in an orchestra when you divide certain notes of a chord or melodies to certain sections of the orchestra or the divided sections of the orchestra. Let me clarify. Instead of holding a C chord like on the piano, like C, E, G with two hands and then copy paste that to the strings and to the brass and perhaps even to the woodwinds, um, I think you get more clarity, for example, with the C chord, if you would let the basses and the cellos play the, like the ground note or the the main note is the, the C note, and then divide notes from the chord, perhaps to violins or to violas and to brass. So it's like separated, but when it's played together, they play the chord basically. Am I clarifying myself? What I'm trying to say is orchestration is a true art form that I'm even trying to learn every day and try to get better at. The thing I'm trying to say is the better the orchestration, perhaps even done by a professional orchestrator or something like that, um, the better the note separation will be of the orchestra and the more pleasant it will sound in the most broadest sense of the word. But the thing I'm trying to say is there is so much energy uh, and already fre like frequency taken up in the frequency spectrum by a metal band. We have the bass, drums and the guitars and screaming vocals or clean vocals. And under that, you wanna have like a supporting orchestra. So I would say before even going into mixing an orchestra, perhaps take some time into orchestration itself, like note separation. For example, when I write a song that has orchestration in it, I make sure that the bass is playing, I mean the, the electric bass, the metal bass, is playing the exact same notes as the basses from the orchestra and that the cellos are playing the same thing, perhaps even an octave higher. That way I know beforehand, before mixing, I know I'm gonna have a clear note foundation in that, like in the lower end of the mix, like the low part, like 100 hertz and that kind of stuff. Having that said, the same thing goes for the higher end of the frequency spectrum. So let's say you have like an alt flute and the melody isn't really popping through, and you think like, okay, maybe I should add like a lot of high end, like with an EQ. But instead of doing that, you could also um, duplicate the part the alt flute's playing and let the piccolo play the same thing, an octave higher maybe, or two flutes play the octave higher. That way, without EQ, you get a higher sense of the melody without doing any EQ moves. So I think it's best to get the sources right which is a crucial thing in my opinion with orchestration. So for like, again, like I said, instead of having a lot of EQ on one separate instrument, perhaps add another instrument that plays the same thing a melody higher or with some parts an octave lower. Depends on the source and the kind of stuff, but hopefully you get the point I'm trying to make here. The things you do before mixing, a well orchestrated piece, like thought, like the whole thought process, before it. I basically would say the whole songwriting process before it. I'm not sure who said this quote, but I fully agree with this 100%, which is a well-arranged song equals a well-balanced mix. Having that said, um, it all depends on taste, but in my opinion, uh, if two dual guitars would play a lot of sweet arpeggios and then the, the, like, the violins would do crazy stuff and the brass would do crazy stuff. There is so much uh, attention a brain can do to certain elements in a mix. So take for example one of my favorite metal songs of all time, uh, Prognus of the Great Apocalypse by Dimo Borgir. When you listen to that song, the only thing the guitars are doing 
is palm muting the same riff. Dun, 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 dun. That's it. And the cool thing about that, just because of those palm mute things, it leaves a ton of space for the whole orchestra. And you can hear it in the song. It's just doing those palm mutes and the whole orchestra lifts it up. And when there's like more, I would say like speed picking, like 60 notes, you can see or hear that the orchestra is perhaps taking a couple steps back and doing more like legato kind of stuff, like more, more slow, more romantic, if that makes any sense. But you can hear really, and I mean really well, that everything has been thought out. And I really, really can't stress enough how important that is for a clear mix, or else your whole mix will get cluttered. Now, having said all that, let's dive into the mixing. All right, so here we are in the project of one of my new songs from my upcoming album. Um, this is a song with a lot of orchestration in it, and I thought it would be a good example for this video. So uh, we're gonna focus on two parts. We're gonna focus on the intro chugger riff, and we're gonna focus on the chorus, because that's where a lot of uh, orchestral elements take place that are interesting for this video. So let's start with the intro, and after the intro, I'll skip to the chorus. Alright, and now let's jump from the uh, mid section of the song to the chorus. So I'm gonna start a little bit before the chorus. Alright, so pretty cool if I say so. Um, there's a lot of ground to cover, so let's get into it. So, like I said in the introduction uh, section of the video, or the explanation section of the video, uh, about the arrangement kind of, kind of stuff. So for an example, with the low end of the mix, I can show you that uh, the bass and the basses from the orchestra and the celly are playing the same notes. So I've got the celly solo of the, uh, the string sections, the basses, the celly of the solo strings, and the bass guitar from the metal band. And as you can tell, that kind of stuff, or even with the riffs. They're all playing the same stuff, so there is a clear foundation in the mix, which is very, very important because a lot of harmonizing things in sub frequencies, in my opinion, don't really work well. Like I wouldn't do um, that the bass guitar of the metal band and then the bass from the from the violin sections or from the string sections play like a minor third or something. I personally, I'm not a big fan of that. I'd rather do something an octave higher that like different notes combine and kind of stuff. But when it comes to really low notes, I like to keep it simple. Let the bass from the metal band and the, the basses from the violin sections and stuff like that play the same thing. Now, one important thing to say 
is um, in most metal mixes you have either the kick below the bass, so the most subby thing is the kick, or the bass um, below the kick, so the most subby thing frequency wise would be the bass. I'm a mixer who likes to have the most heavy thing of the mix be the kick drum, which is like really pumpy, that's what, that's what I really like, I like to really feel the kick. So um, take that in consideration what I just told you with those, those lowest, lowest uh, frequencies. So because of that, because of the kick drum is the lowest thing in my mix, which is around almost like 50 hertz pumping or something like that, let me see. So I can see it's like around 50 hertz. So a very big um, thing to be aware of before mixing orchestration. Like when I mix film score, there's almost no filtering going on at the lower stuff because um, there's not really like a, a metal band mix in the way of the frequency spectrum. So it's much broader. Um, when I mix metal, because the lower thing is around 50 hertz, because the kick drum in metal does a lot of crazy things compared to like pop music or rock music, like we have insane things, like our drummers can do really fast stuff so that can really build up. Because that kick drum is the lowest thing, I need to make room for that. So I can't let, um, in my opinion, at least in my mixes, I can't let the, the celly and the basses of the strings or trombones and that kind of stuff um, take over that that section, like when I would mix film score or a film trailer, that kind of stuff, no filtering going on there basically, most of the time. But in a metal band, I make room for the kick. So with basses or the lower part of the string sections and the brass sections, I like to filter off everything below 50 hertz. The illusion of the bass and the basses from the uh, from the string section, I mean the bass, the metal bass and the bass from the string section still give you the feeling that those silly are almost below 50 hertz. So I got everything filtered off as well with the drums, like make room for everything because there's so much going on. I have my, like, which I do normally, my, my cymbals filtered to up to like fifth, what is it? Like 600 hertz. Um, my kick is filtered like 44 hertz because I know I need to make room for stuff. All right, so let's start with the strings first. As you can tell, I already have everything filtered off with, I'm not sure about the slow, but it sounded right around 100 hertz even. So when I take this filter off, you can almost tell there's some energy loss because I filter off like the really low subby part of the basses and the silly. But because we're in the metal mix and the bass guitar we have there and the kick drums there, um, I'm not really missing it, to be honest. So I like it around 90 hertz. And let's listen to it together with the band. All right, so what I noticed, because um, metal mixes tend to be brighter than the average orchestral mix we need to add some uh, add some highs there on that on the on the strings bus so i have all my strings routed to a strings bus to a bus group and personally i like to do broad strokes first so eq moves that have effect on all the strings because all of this and all of this is going into this bus and then when I notice still some issues, then perhaps I'll go into like individual tracks, but that's rarely the case. So I noticed there are some mids, um, or like some mids are in the way, and I want some clarity, some highs. So what I know, mean about the mids is this. That's like really honky.
All right, and I'll add some highs. And now let's compare it. That sounds better. And to be honest, when I would mix like film score stuff or like a trailer kind of stuff, I perhaps would it would be like most of the time it would be around here. But again, because metal mixers tend to be brighter on average, like when I compare this to the Dark Knight soundtrack or some uh, John Williams from the last Star Wars movie soundtracks with a metal mix, odd thing to do, but I did it for fun. Uh, I noticed that metal mixes on average are brighter to that sense. All right, so we need these strings to poke through these heavy guitars. And you can hear them because when I take this off, it becomes like a more mid thing, but because those guitars are like taking up a lot of room, You can definitely hear the strings poking through those guitars. And like when I would finalize a song like this, there would be a ton of automation to make room for stuff to like, perhaps let strings bit go down, then the brass goes up and that kind of stuff. But now we're gonna focus on EQ moves and a tiny bit of compression later. But for now, like how it sounds now. That sounds pretty good. That really pokes through, I really like that. Because when I take it off, I could, could hear it, but with this on, cool, really like that. So now let's go to the brass section. I'm just gonna put the fader up and see where it fits volume wise. That sounds pretty good. Uh, I think it could add a, I could add a tiny bit of brightness. I'm gonna filter up because the tuba is really low. Because around here, around this section, like 100 hertz, that's where the bass guitar is really pounding. So I wanna make room for that because I wanna keep the clarity in my mix. But okay, so the brightness. So let's compare that. Yeah. Be careful with this because when you add a lot of brightness, um, because of the balance of the EQ curve, uh, it can actually make the, the brass and even the violins and the other elements of the orchestra sound thinner. So be aware of that. Okay, because I notice now when I turn it off, it sounds warmer, which I also like. I do hear some mid honk. Okay, 
let's check it in the mix, that second chorus. And here, uh, I'll think I'll add a tiny bit of compression. Really like this compression, by the way. Yeah, so I really like that it's compressing a bit more during those high notes. Just to even it out a tiny bit. I could also use a limiter, but for, for now I just like the vintage compressor on this. So remember in the intro I said that um, like instead of adding a ton of high, perhaps like double it with a different instrument or add an octave. So you can definitely hear it during the violins during this part and I'll solo it first. But when I solo it, um, that during the second round of the last chorus, um, the high violins add, get like an octave higher and that really pops through. So let me first show like this. Here it comes. That's the first round. So because it plays an octave higher, there's more emotion going on there. And you can definitely hear it pop through the mix better. So, okay, so let's go to the choir now, because during that last part of the, um, of the second chorus, choir comes in. And I got these three bust into one group. So female, male, and a big choir of both. So here we go. So I'm going to check the part before it because in the mix I want to have like an emotional value. So let's see how it feels. Yeah, that definitely brings it to another level. That's, that's why I put it quiet there. Now it's be very careful with EQing basically anything, but especially with choirs, when you cut too much mid, it becomes like very thin and brittle. And the vocal, because of evolution purposes, but a vocal is a mid-range instrument. That's where our hearing is most, uh, most effective. So be careful with cutting the mid. So I already cut off a lot of frequencies below, which takes away a tiny bit of power from the male vocals. Those really low ones, but again, I need room and there's still some of it left, which I really like. But basically, almost always during choirs, there's a frequency around between 2K and 4K 
that's really fizzly and annoying and I'll try to find it and then like hit the switch like an on and off button and you can definitely hear it um, that you take away some nastiness from the vocals. So it's 2.6 kilohertz. I'm gonna take it down and turn it off and on again and you can definitely hear the difference. So I'm gonna exaggerate it now. So I'll just take it away. But now I hear a whistle frequency and this is dangerous because I'm listening to the solo. I'm not sure if I even hear it in the whole mix. Yeah, okay, so there's one note poking through, like a high whistle, which I can po hear poking through the whole mix. That's it. That one. So let's reduce that. I think a better option would be to use frequency the dynamic EQ. So dynamic EQ. So it's around 1.8 kilohertz. So let's open frequency. Yeah, that sounds way better to me. Let's just double check it again so you can hear the difference. So we can see it moving, that means it's on. Yeah, be careful with that, but that sounds better to me. Check before it kicks in. And I'm missing some air. Okay, so before I continue, um, there is a solo by a great solo violinist called Chris from the Joker Violin Project, amazing violin player. It's a solo, so um, I'll let you hear the solo and then my thought process during the EQ moves I'll do. So the only thing I'm noticing, because this is also going through the strings bus, but it could use a tiny bit less mids. A 
that. And I'll probably use a tiny bit of compression. So I'm doing a late attack because I really want to hear the attack of the violin, like when the when the bow is hitting the strings. So that one's really dry, but I'll, I'll dig into a reverb a tiny bit later. The last thing I want to do is before getting into reverb is the uh, percussion film score drums. So on these, uh, what I really like to do is remove some of the everything below five hertz kind of like an EQ move like this and doing the opposite on the um, on the high end which results into this so let's compare that I don't like compression on these drums, but I think I could use some attack on these hits. And it does make them sound a tiny bit bigger. There's a music box in this song bef before I forget this. So let's uh, dig into that. Wouldn't need a lot of work, I think. Cool, okay, so now to round up this video, reverb. So what I personally like to do is use one reverb for everything orchestra related and sometimes even let like solo guitars or the, the cymbals and hi-hats or the rooms from the drums go into that same reverb so it gels more together. I'm not a big fan of using a ton of different reverb plugins. Most of the time I pick one reverb for that particular song or album and then stick with it. So a really cool one actually is called Reference, which comes with Cubase. And I'm from the Netherlands, so of course I had to uh, choose Dutch Concert Hall. I think it's from uh, Carré, I'm not sure, but uh, it sounds good. So let's first check it on the strings. I'm not using a lot of it, but just to add a tiny bit of depth. So I'm sending that to the Dutch Hall, which sounds pretty big. 
and I'll turn it off and on again so you can hear the difference. So that's enough for me because when I use too much, the strings sound a bit further away, which can be cool for some slower sections, like for this mid section, for example. I could do more, so it really depends on the song. I would, like, when I would finalize this mix, I would definitely automate that there's more room in that section. But during the middle part, um, I really want the clarity and I wouldn't say a lot of the attack, but some more definition of what's going on uh, instead of moving it uh, further in the back. Unless that's what you want, so it depends. But for this song, I would rather go a bit more direct, but without it, it sounds a bit too dry. I love that. Cool. So let's go to the brass, and I'm going to this section because there's more, like the brass keeps going on for a while. So let's do the same thing. So the Dutch hall. Now it almost sounds thin without the uh, the reverb. Let's go to the choirs. Love it, but a bit too much, I think, or I need to cut some mids. Yeah, that riff really makes the choir sound warmer. Like if I go to the max and I'll just bypass it. Oh, I love that reverb. Oh my God. The tail. Love that. So before we go off, uh, there's a solo here. And I'll show you that like blending the solo guitars with the reef of the orchestra can be a really cool thing to do. So I'll first turn these off. I also have a bit of delay here, which is the ping pong. Love that one. Here we go. with the band. I'm 
lowering the guitars a bit automation wise because those leads take a lot of room because I have two leads left and right or like one left and one right and there's one in the middle. So let's take one more listen. Alright, there you have it. So there are some basic things you can do to mix orchestra together with a, within a metal mix. So if you have any questions, please, please, please let me know in the comments. I'll be happy to, add, to, to answer them. And uh, until then, see you next time. Take care. Cheers. Mm -hmm.